Hello everyone, it's Brian of the Cost of Crypto. Welcome to today's episode, number 24, Stacking Crypto Series number 2, Lending Your Crypto. In this episode, I'm going to go a little bit into detail about how people are able to earn crypto and build their stack by lending it. So let's get started. In this episode, I'm going to go over what crypto deposits are, how do they work, the advantages and the benefits, and the disadvantages and the risks. But before I go on, I want to make a note that nothing I say constitutes financial advice, as I'm not a professional financial advisor. You should always research something before you invest in it, and you should never invest money that you cannot afford to lose. So with that said, what are crypto deposits? Crypto deposits are financial instruments that are offered by regulated firms whereby providing cryptocurrency, usually Bitcoin, Ethereum, maybe a stablecoin, you are paid a yield and that cryptocurrency that you are depositing with that institution gets loaned out to people and entities that borrow that cryptocurrency and pay them interest on that loan. When you buy your Bitcoin and you self-custody it, or even if you have it in third-party custody, it's not doing anything. Any change in value and any change in the quantity of Bitcoin that you have is dependent on an appreciation in the price and any additional Bitcoin that you purchase. So what are the advantages and benefits of this? The advantages and benefits are that you're able to earn a yield, usually paid out in the cryptocurrency that you normally wouldn't earn. For example, with Bitcoin, by loaning it to a financial institution who is paying a yield on the deposits, so it's a way to generate yield when otherwise you would not be. The disadvantages of this, and it'll be explained a little further in an audio clip that I have, is that By giving your Bitcoin to a third-party entity, it's the old rule, not your keys, not your crypto. You're incurring third-party risk and entrusting that institution to not lose your Bitcoin, to not make a bad loan, and to be able to cover their reserve so that if you need to withdraw that cryptocurrency and bring it back into your self-custody, they will have the assets on hand to be able to do so. So there are some risks to that. Also, you have an opportunity to leverage that interest and grow the size of your Bitcoin holdings. By loaning cryptocurrency to these institutions, it brings it within the realm of regulatory capture where Bitcoin, that asset, is now going into the hands of a regulated financial entity that reports to the IRS, that reports to the Treasury, and by extension, you'll need to report that information to the Treasury, to the IRS, and subject to any given KYC rules in order to sign up with these companies. So who are the major players in this space? Well, one of the largest ones is BlockFi. BlockFi was started in 2019, and they operate very much like a regular bank where they take deposits, and they provide loans. The tweak to this was that Bitcoin is the asset that serves both as the deposit currency, but also as something that can be borrowed, as well as also being able to borrow a loan based in US dollars. When BlockFi did this, this gave them a very unique advantage as that at the time, there were not any other institutions doing that. And since then, and especially with the growth of DeFi, decentralized finance applications where people can earn yield both by lending their crypto out and also by providing liquidity for trading pools that acts more as a payment platform. A lot of other players have gotten into the game of lending and crypto deposits. Another another company, which really isn't a company, but more of the app, is Abra. Abra runs a app where you can buy 
and sell cryptocurrencies and numerous national fiat currencies. Well, they now offer the ability to, to offer deposits and loans on cryptocurrency. Another one that came into the realm is the Pay app. I have mentioned the Pay app before as they are a rebate app that you use when you make purchases using credit cards that you have registered through your Pay app account. They recently crypto deposits where they work with Wire out of Australia, and you're able to purchase Bitcoin on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, and earn anywhere between four to eight percent yields on that Bitcoin. One of the nice things about PayApp is that you're able to withdraw that Bitcoin and take self-custody. Another popular application is HODL HODL. We began instituting that allows people, which is a decentralized application, to bypass one of the advantages of this is that you do not fall into the regulatory capture where you have to provide KYC information. Having a third party entity take custody of the cryptocurrency, both from the depositor and to hand it out to the person borrowing it. There's numerous other players out there, but those were the four main ones that I have an awareness and some knowledge of and I wanted to mention. Now to explain the mechanics of how this works, I want to share with you a clip. I want to share with you a clip on a Blockworks interview with Dan Held where he goes into description about how the mechanics of Bitcoin deposits work. But before I go on, I want to take a brief pause with a word from our sponsor. Hello everyone. I want to tell you about my favorite podcast tool. It's Anchor FM. It's got everything you need to make a podcast. Recording function, sound clips, background music, transitions. You can upload your own audio files, and you can use Anchor's built-in editing tools to make a great podcast. Anchor will distribute your podcast among multiple platforms so that the more you grow, the greater reach becomes. You can also monetize your episodes right off the bat. No minimum audience. It can get started making your podcast right from your phone or PC. So don't wait. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. So let's go deeper. And let's keep using BlockFi for this example. So what is the reason why we got, I got it. If anyone's interested in BlockFi, I had an uh, interview with Flory Marquez, uh, the, one of the co-founders of BlockFi, where we talked about this pretty in depth, but at a high level, like why does BlockFi want my Bitcoin? What are they, what are they doing with it? Great question. So, okay, how are they earning this return? And, and then uh, as a company, how do they operate? Well, what these companies do is they take your Bitcoin and they find folks who want to borrow it. And there's a couple different sources of borrow. Uh, there's, for example, the classic futures arbitrage trade, the cash and carry trade, where folks are taking advantage of a premium that exists between the futures and spot price. So that's a source of yield generation. Uh, there's also, at times, there's a premium that exists with the um, GBTC premium. GBTC is a trust product that sometimes has a premium associated with it to where folks can capture that delta as well, where you can buy spot, uh, construct an arrangement where you're essentially neutral and you just capture that spread. Um, there's also, so people take, so the borrowers are using that Bitcoin for those activities. There's also shorters, so they short Bitcoin. A lot of Bitcoiners don't like lending out their coins to shorters because they perceive that as very anti-Bitcoin. I disagree. And Ben Davenport had a really great quote here. Ben Davenport is the former co-founder of BitGo. He's a longtime Bitcoin OG, really great guy. He had a great quote on this where he said, by lending your coin to short sellers, you're earning yield on the, on the tiers of wrecked people who hate Bitcoin. I mean, that's, that's what we do. I mean, Bitcoin goes up over time. Like there's no better most, trade than that. <laughs> yeah. Most shorters get wrecked, you know, when they try to short Bitcoin. So over time you're earning a yield on their tiers, you know, so actually it's very virtuous. You're stacking more coin as they get wrecked. So a lot of people perceive it as like, oh, you're helping them out. You're not helping them out at all. You're just enabling them to place the trade. And most of the time the trade goes badly. <laughs> so, um, those are a couple sources of borrow. There's another one, which is DeFi. Some people borrow Bitcoin, get it wrapped, and then put that into DeFi protocols. 
the yield on different DeFi protocols, it depends on what type of yield is being generated in DeFi. I don't want to dive too deeply in there because it gets really technical, and that's not a lot of, of what I cover right now. I cover more centralized uh, yield generation opportunities. But those are the primary risks that you're taking with your coin is they take your coin, lend them to folks who are doing these sort of trades. Um, now, but most of these borrowing activities are done on a partial collateralization or over collateralized basis. So what that means is if they take your Bitcoin and lend them to someone else, that's not uncollateralized. So they've posted maybe 70 or 80% USDT or USD value to collateralize that Bitcoin loan. So it's not like they're just giving them 10 Bitcoin. They're like, hey, pay us back at a future date. That loan is typically collateralized. Um, you also have something interesting, too, to where different margin pools that exchanges require borrowed coin in order to operate. Or they require coin in order to operate. So, you know, for these lending platforms, exchanges could be customers of theirs as well, which that would be a very low risk profile. Exchanges manage all of their own risks in their margin pool. And margin pool issues are very rare. Um, for example, like Poloniex had one with the Clams coin uh, where there's a socialized loss. But Poloniex is a very, um, I would say, relatively immaterial exchange with almost no trading volume. So they didn't have any money to cover that hole. Whereas like if there's a margin trading issue at a big exchange, they'd likely plug that hole or something like that. So um, <clears throat> some of these borrowers are very reputable and we don't know what that loan book looks like. We don't know how many small hedge funds, big hedge funds, exchanges are borrowers from these lending platforms, but we do know that it's a mix of all of the above. And so there you have the mechanics of what goes on behind the scenes when you loan out your cryptocurrency. Not only do you have the risks of the third party that you are working through, especially if it's a centralized entity, a CFI entity, like say BlockFi or Abra or PayApp, FireWire, but you also have the risk of the parties that they're dealing with. So it's an extra layer to have to consider and those things are subject to the conditions in the price markets. And this about wraps up the episode. Hope you enjoyed that. I've got links in the show notes if you want to learn a little bit more about some of the different apps mentioned. Uh, as always, do your research. I can't stress that enough. Uh, when you are loaning out crypto, it's just like anything else. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. And you expose yourself to third-party risk. So understand the risks. Understand what's at stake. I mean, use this episode to build a foundation, but do your research. Go to the news websites. Go look around for useful links shared on Twitter. Go on YouTube. There's plenty of information out there where you can educate yourself on the risks, on the vulnerabilities, and make an educated decision. So with that, as usual, you can follow along with Tiny Crypto Blog at tinycryptoblog.com. If you are on WordPress, you are able to subscribe directly to the blog. If not, you can subscribe by email. And you can also follow along on all the video platforms, social media sites, and podcast platforms listed in the show notes. And with that, be well, everyone. Talk to you soon. Thank you.